This week's chapter, we're going to be looking at the subject of graphic design. Now, in graphic design, the artist is endeavoring to present a very specific message. The artist wants the viewer to really get the message even above and beyond appreciating the art for its own sake. So unlike earlier chapters where we explored how each individual interprets a work of art and all the ways that people can interpret a work of art, in graphic design the goal is to have a very specific meaning. For example, in advertising often this message will be conveyed in a repetitive message, a repetitive word, slogan, image, and that's how the designer will get the image into the, the viewer's unconscious. Graphic designers attend to the visual presentation of information as it is embodied in words and images. Okay, that's a quote from your textbook. I'm going to read it again. Graphic designers attend to the visual presentation of information as it is embodied in words and or images. So this includes all sorts of things that are in our daily lives, like books, book covers, newspapers, ads, all kinds of packaging, CD covers, and then it goes into TV, film credits, and on and on. I'm sitting here looking at a bookshelf in my studio, and every single one of those books was created by a book designer, by a graphic designer. And ideally, when it's really working, I don't think so much about the design as I simply get the information that the designer would like to convey. Now, it's a very old art form. Early writing is an ancient form of graphic design. Consider the early symbols that represented certain words or sounds and later became written language. Now, this was used in many ancient cultures, Chinese uh, writing, uh, Egyptian writing, and on and on. Even uh, probably predating those times. Graphic design as we know it today is a little bit more recent. It has its roots in really it started with the invention of the printing press in the 15th century and then with the Industrial Revolution people started pro mass producing goods and those needed to be uh, distributed to the populace and people had to become convinced that they needed to purchase them. So with the printing press and the mass production of goods there was a need to get these messages out to a great uh, the populace to humanity at large. Now as people gained the ability to reproduce a message countless times then the way of creating words on a page for mass consumption became a consideration. In other words, how is, are the words arranged on the page so that they can be most easily read? So as goods reach these mass audiences, then there was this need also, as well as advertising, to have thoughtful and effective packaging. Now let's go ahead and look at the very basic origins. And we're also going to look at how we interpret um, symbols and signs. This is from your textbook. Oh, I would like you to follow along in your textbook as we go because you'll be, we, will, we will be referring to that. Oh, look at these two symbols. Now, symbols in general allow us to communicate on the very most basic level. This is how people can speak even if they don't share the same language. We might have different words for something, but a symbol as presented in a simple image can be recognized by people that speak many languages. Um, now letters are also symbols and they are symbols that represent sound. Now here we have the yin-yang and the swastika. So first let's talk about the yin-yang symbol. It's an ancient symbol. It's also called the Tao and um, it's the symbol for Tai Chi. It's a symbol for the balance of the yin and the yang and basically that would be the harmony of opposites. And here we have a beautiful graphic interpretation of this ongoing harmony of opposites. You could say night today, male and female, um, you know, earth and heaven, and on and on. And I think one of the beautiful and effective things about this particular image is that you'll notice is that within one there is the other. So within the white shape there's a little bit of the dark shape. 
Within the dark shape, there is a little bit of the white shape. So you could say the white represents the creative principle and that, and that the dark represents the receptive principle. Or the white is heaven and the dark is earth. And yet with each, within each one is a somehow a seed of the other. And they're always moving. Okay, now let's talk about the swastika. I really don't need to go through with any of you what the swastika means to our current society. But do you know that it's an ancient symbol? And it actually comes from um, a, a Sanskrit word, swastika. And it means auspicious or good luck, good fortune. And this is the meaning that this symbol has held for literally thousands and thousands of years. Now, naturally, what happened was it was uh, kind of taken by the Nazis. It was put on their warplanes. It was used as their symbol. But let's look at some earlier interpretations of it. This is an early swastika. And then this next picture I find quite moving because it's the Dalai Lama, the spiritual leader of the Tibetan people. And he's really the head of the Tibetan Buddhists in the world today. Um, he's gotten a Nobel Peace Prize. And look, he's sitting there with a couple of swastikas in front of him. Now, sometimes what happens is that the nowadays when they use swastikas in Tibetan art, they often reverse them. So they're going in the opposite direction. Uh, although that is not the case here, it is, in fact, the case with this one. It's going in the opposite direction. All right, so let's move on from the, the basic point with all of this is that symbols convey a basic meaning, and yet as we go through, um, we relate to them with our society, they can take on additional meaning. So let's return to the idea of symbols that go beyond um, any specific language. This is, these are actually a series of symbols that were created in order to reach travelers um, and convey messages. Now go ahead and look through these and, and see if you can really interpret their meaning right off the bat. There's the bus, the cab, the rental car, the cocktail, coffee shop, mail a letter, etc, etc. So it's, it is interesting to consider that there was a time when these had not yet been invented. And even though they have a sort of a generic anonymous feeling to them, there was a designer who sat down and came up with these images. It takes a certain kind of an artistic mind to be a strong graphic designer. And often that is a mind that tends towards simplicity. Because really the strongest designs are those which are the simplest. Now just for fun, I want to go ahead and look at some logos. Now in your book they talk about how logos have evolved. Like the UPS logo and the ABC logo. But I want to look at some other ones. Now this is probably recognizable to some of you, but I'll tell you that just when I put it in this slide was the first time that I saw the fox. Now, I use Firefox all the time. That's how I work in the class. But because it's a small logo, and quite frankly, I never paid that much attention to it, I just saw the fox. And if you look at it from a purely um, creative uh, critiquing point of view, this is a very effective logo. First we have complementary colors. You have the oranges and the blues. So it really it pops. And then we have this very simple graphic of a fox turning into fire. So pretty simple. Now let me see, what does this make you think of? Ah, oh, now you've probably seen that before. Um, I'm carrying on. Let's continue. Uh, does that make any of you want to go get a good strong cup of coffee? Now, when, it's interesting to think of someone sat down and came up with this logo. And they probably came up with many. And at some point, it was decided that this was the one. And now, as a result, it's become the international symbol for a uh, coffee shop. Now, let's look at one more. How about this? This one has certainly grown in popularity through the years. And look at how simple it is. This is a very simple design, and yet it was created uh, to represent a business, you know, Mac computers and the whole um, Apple line, that can allow the artist to create extremely complex graphic statements. So this really tells you why 
you know that is such a recognizable symbol that it really you really need to say no more and now this symbol really rep represents the company more than the words Apple themselves really would communicating oh we're going to talk now about typography and layout communicating through the written language is really an ancient art form as well as a very practical means for transmitting information in Chinese, Japanese, and Islamic cultures, calligraphy is really considered a high art form. And it's fun to look at the art calligraphy from these societies because some of it is quite beautiful, whether or not you speak the language. Now, in Western languages, callig calligraphy has not really reached this high estate, but calligraphy was used in ancient Roman times. The Greeks used it. It's been used really... Um, since antiquity to convey a message and the the Romans used it to say things like you know aren't we great we won the battle you know <laughs> our emperor is the best emperor ever that's the kind of things that they said now somewhere along the line though we had to invent type and this all started in 1450 when movable type was invented and this brought typography to a whole new level what do I mean by movable type? That means that you have these letters that you can set up to create words and then you can print the same message over and over again because you've used uh, the type to create the words and this is on a printing press. But who invented the first type? Well you know who it was. It was this really great artist. I think I'll show you his work first. Albrecht Dürer. D-U-R-E-R. And hey, just for fun, try doing a search of Durer when you uh, get finished with this presentation. He's best known for um, a drawing that he did called Praying Hands that many people have seen. And this is called My Mother, which is an interesting thing because he's got his mother as an angel playing the lute. Now, quite frankly, he's one of my favorite artists. He was a master printmaker, but he was a really smart man, too. He made a lot of money by creating art prints. He was the first one to mass produce art so that the middle classes could enjoy it. And being a smart man, he developed the first typography. So typography is a standardized kind of type that can be used. And what Durer did in this case was he started with a square and he figured out how the type could actually fit within the square. Now I'd say that we're pretty lucky that it was an artist of the stature of Durer that invented the first type because he took such things into consideration as the balance of thick and thin. These are actually his early drawings of type as he was working out how to make uh, an aesthetically pleasing type and also one that was easy to read. Now in his day, the squares that you see would be either carved out of wood or they would be cast lead. But nowadays, of course, most layout is done on computer, and the resources for type are, quite frankly, endless. And I'll tell you that in my own creative life, over the last couple of years, I've done a lot of book illustration and layout. And I approached it thinking, oh, you know, you just put type in. Oh, no. The science and study and fine art of typography is, is a vast subject. And the thing about it is, when it works, you don't even notice it. It's an interesting art because when the artist is most successful, all you notice is the message, not the type. But when it doesn't work, then you notice. Maybe it's hard to read. Maybe you stop and think, wow, look at that font. Well, if you do, I would say that that's not as successful of a, of a typography project. Now, I encourage you all to notice as you're driving around, looking at signs, looking at ads, noticing things, ask yourself, what is effective type and what is not? So we're going to look at a little bit of art calligraphy just for fun because type can be very powerful in how it conveys a message. There's one. Makes you want to go wash your hands. That says, read all about it. This one's kind of hard to read to me. And that's an, another thing is that if it's hard to read, not successful. Let's just look at two more. Oh, I think that's pretty successful because it sure conveys the message. And this one I'm going to leave up until for 15 seconds because 
it's a wonderful message and I don't know if you can read the whole thing but at the bottom it was said by Michael Jordan okay Michael Jordan 